Amen. If you're ready for the word, somebody shout, oh yeah. God bless you. Let's stand for the reading of God's word today as we look in John 19. We're going to look at verse 8 through verse 11. John 19, 8 through 11. And while you're turning there, let me just stop right here and say thank you to this church uh, for a tremendous summer. I, I'm telling you, I've been associated with Christ Way for over going on 20 years now. March will be 20 years. And I know that summer Christ Way, we, we travel a good bit, and that's good. I want you to travel and have fun. And, but I'll tell you, we've had the best summer attendance-wise, finance-wise. I, I don't think we dipped into threes but once. And I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful. Pastor Keith is thankful. Pastor Jonathan, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Rodney, because we ain't been sweating. Where's all our people out? Bless God. Thank you for at least doing it all on one Sunday. You know, just everybody getting it out of the way. But uh, we've had a great summer. I want to say thank you for your support. Thank you for your faithfulness. We've picked up some people. It's been a great, great season. I thank you for that. I, I like this thought here today, and I want to share it with you in John 19, 8 through 11. If you're there, somebody give me an enthusiastic amen. amen. Here it says in verse 8, Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more afraid. And he went to the praetorium and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? You don't know this, but I'm kind of a big deal. People know me. I can have you crucified. And Jesus answered, you can have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. I want to talk to you on a thought this morning, simply entitled, Sometimes Ignorance is Not So Bliss. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we pray you today. We ask that your anointing would be here, Father. I ask that your Holy Spirit would be in this building as we get into your word for the next couple of minutes. And I pray your Holy Spirit, God, would touch the strength and encourage somebody today that might be facing an opponent, might be facing some bad news, might be facing some adversary, but God, to be reminded that just because they believe that they're in charge doesn't mean that they are in charge. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you and be seated. It's a unique situation here. To me, this conversation between the Roman governor Pontius Pilate and the Lord Jesus Christ sums up not only all the activity that is associated with the crucifixion, but also really everyday life that can occur on this planet. What's interesting is you've got the man who's in charge, a nervous wreck. It's interesting to me. Pontius Pilate's speaking in this text and he's thumping his chest saying, I'm a big deal. I got a lot of things going on. I got many leather-bound books, and my bedroom smells of rich mahogany. I'm a big deal. But even in all that fast chump, thump, thumping, he's a nervous wreck. Because I think deep down on the inside, he knows what we all know. He's not the one in charge. Yet years of duty of, of dealing with his, of his country, dealing with hardened criminals have given him the instinct to tell the guilty, and this man does not fit the category. In fact, everything in him tells him that this man, Jesus, is innocent. But he can't let go. If he lets him go, there might be another revolt. There's another revolt in this horrid region he's been assigned. One more uprising could cost him his job. And so he's nervous about dealing with the people. He is questioning this man, Jesus. And he's able, he says, I'm able to set you free. But Jesus is not answering him. Jesus is being quiet. Jesus will not answer any of his questions. At this, Pilate tries to remind Jesus who he's dealing with. And this is what he says. Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Here is where I have, the mo where I think, the most important line of all the crucifixion that can sum up its power and its glory when Jesus answered and says, you could have no power at all unless my God had given it to you. Think about that for just a second. If you're not careful, you will miss it. Jesus was saying to the most powerful man 
in this story that you've got no power at all unless it's that power that's been allowed and given to you from heaven. You've got no power other than what has been allowed from God. You see, Jesus was saying, friend, you think you're calling the shots. You sit there in your fancy robe. You sit there on your throne of power, and you've convinced yourselves that you're calling the shots. But I'm here to tell you the only reason why I'm in this position right now is because God has allowed it. Let me stop right here and talk to somebody right now that your sickness, your debt, your depression, your problem, your failure, your adversary has stood up before you and declared to you that you're defeated, that he's got the power to grab you, the power to crush you. Your fear is looking at you and telling you that everything's over with. That problem on the job is staring at you saying, I've got you right where you want you. They're wanting to believe that they are in control. But what you've got to wake up and realize that nothing shall come to you unless it be the will of God. If you be in God's hand, then no man can pluck you out. What you're going through is not the plan of your adversary. It's not the plan of that person. You are in the plan of God. And if you be in the plan of God, he will see you through. Come on and bless the Lord Jesus in this house. We see that. We understand that. And he says this. He says, you think you've got this, but what you don't understand, Pilate, is you're playing your part in this great story to save all of mankind. I'm standing here not because I've stumbled into it. I'm standing here not because it's just a little bit of an issue. I am standing here right now because this has been a plan and God is going to see it through. Jesus was dealing with several people we're going to look at in just a moment that convinced themselves they were in charge and all they were doing was setting him up for victory. You know, there's an old saying that says ignorance is bliss. Anybody ever heard that saying? Somebody let me see your hand if you've heard that saying. Ignorance is bliss. You know what I mean? Sometimes uh, it, it's good to, to, to not be aware. Let me tell you this. You might not be a very funny person. I might not be a very funny person. I find that highly unlikely, but it's possible. I might, we might not be funny people. And people might be laughing at our jokes, and you might be doing that for real, just to pity us. But you don't know that. You really think you're funny. Sometimes ignorance is bliss, amen? Men, we're always flexing in the mirror thinking we're buff, but we know our six-packs turn into a keg. You know what I'm talking about? It's a, it, sometimes, I might not ought to make that joke, amen. I'm talking about root beer. Somebody help me out. God bless me. Jesus, I need your help. I might have just fell out of the anointing right there, somebody. Say a prayer for me. But you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes ignorance is bliss. But I want to tell you something. These people thought they were in charge. You got Caiaphas celebrating, the Pharisees just going through all these motions, the people that ripped out Jesus' beard, the soldiers that mocked him, that hit him in the head with the rod, that put on a crown of thorns, and those that crucify him, they thought they were in charge. But honey, sometimes ignorant is not so bliss. Because how many people know that a day came and went when those bodies themselves went in the ground and when they opened their eyes and realized they're in the throne room of heaven, they saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. They thought they were in charge, but how many people found out that they know that sometimes ignorance is not so bliss? There's something in your life that thinks it's in charge, but there's going to come a time when it finds out it's not in charge, but Almighty God is is in charge. We see this. We see these people that have convinced themselves they're in charge and we've dealt with them. Can I tell you a little bit about what I've dealt with in my life? We've dealt with people. Well, before we get there, 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 there's some of you that maybe you're, you're trying for a promotion and your boss just doesn't think you're good enough. There's some of you trying to get a scholarship at the committee just doesn't think you've earned it enough there's people that you, you're, you're trying to fit in and they just look at your negative and they're constantly telling you what you are and what you're not but i'm gonna tell you these people convince themselves they're in charge when they're not I, 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 i'll think about a couple of things i love this story it's a true story when we were living up here and we moved up here the first time almost 20 years ago and it's hard to believe i believe this week is our five-year anniversary of coming home Man, it's hard to believe, and that'll make you scratch your head of how fast time goes by. But I think about when we got up here, and we didn't have two nickels to rub together. 
We were working full-time, I agreed, because that's how much I wanted to be in ministry. I'd work full-time on part-time pay. That's how much I, I wanted to be up here and, and to do ministry. And Carrie's trying to find a job. And a good opportunity had come along. And she went and she applied for this job. Now, you want to talk about an interview. An interview kind of turned into one of those, you know, roasts. You know what I'm talking about, where people just kind of just poke at you? This woman, this man, just pretty much dressed down my wife. And these are some of the things he, honest to God, said. You're not qualified. I'm only doing this as, a, as respect to someone that went to church with us, but that I know uh, it would cost us more to train you. Um, you don't have the right degree. I, I'm just telling you, there's zero percent chance, did he not say that? Zero percent chance that you're going to get this job. Anybody dealt with somebody that, that they, they just, they, they swell up on their own power? Look, a simple note would have been suffice. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to do that. But see, when they think that they're in charge, what they didn't understand is that there was a church praying, and there was a pastor praying, and there was a pastor's wife getting together saying, God, you know the need. You know we don't have something together. We began to pray, and we began to call the things that are not as though they were. And would you know that next week we'd get a phone call saying, I don't know why in the world I'm doing this. That's what he said. Everything in me is telling me this is wrong. This doesn't make sense. I can't believe I'm doing this, but there's something about you. I keep coming back to you. Would you like this job? See, I'm just trying to tell you. There's people that will prop themselves up, but there's only one Jehovah God that reigns on the throne, that angels worship, that demons flee, that people cry out to. They think they're in charge, but there's only one omnipotent God and his name is Jesus. Oh, I'm telling you, that's not the only thing I've gone through. I want to encourage somebody here today. That same year, we went to Mark's Fitzgerald. Anybody remember old Mark's Fitzgerald furniture? They gone. Amen. Bless God. We went in there over here in Center Point. Put those back on. Amen. I thought I was good. I wasn't. We went over here to Center Point. We don't have credit. We don't have money. But we don't have furniture. <laughs> Honest to God, we had three pieces of furniture. We had a mattress with no box springs. I had a chair that acted as my entertainment center with my TV on it. And I had a machete. And somebody said, what's a machete? Home security. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you got to be covered. ADT ain't got nothing on that. You live in an old dark farmhouse. It got dark out there. Son, you, when there's a noise, you needed something, go check it out. We go to Mark Street, Gerald. Jonathan, we picked out all this furniture. Oh, we go get it. We sit down. They said, you ain't got, first of all, you don't have credit. Second of all, you've been on your job three weeks. You don't have enough money. You make this amount. And they laughed at us. Oh, but when we got in the parking lot, we grabbed hands. You know, I think that's what people are forgetting. We said, God, you see where we are? God, we are poor. God, we don't have anything. But God, we got to have something. And we don't got anybody else to turn to, Father. And we said that you said, if we call out to you, that nothing's impossible. I kid you not, by the time we got home, they had called us and said, don't ask me. That's what she said. I, I don't have the words to tell you. But before they start second guessing themselves, what day would you like your furniture delivered? I'm telling you, I've had time after time. Anybody here ever had a doctor tell you it was impossible? I'm telling you, we had three different doctors tell us we can never have children, that it was an impossibility. But aren't you glad they're not in control? Sometimes ignorance is not so bliss. There's somebody who can. There's somebody who will. There's somebody who's able, and his name is Jesus Christ. These people thought they were in charge. Honey, I'm just telling you, I don't know what bad news has crept into your life, but your cancer's not in control. Your God is. I don't know who I'm talking to today, and that cancellation notice that you're going to lose your power. Honey, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. If he could feed a prophet with some ravens, he could send you some money you didn't even know was coming. I'm telling you, I've seen people in my church that we prayed in the altar, and they said, we don't have the money to, to pay our power bill. They're going to cut off our power tomorrow. 
and they went to Walmart after praying and believing and honest to God, guess what came blowing through the parking lot? $300 bills. Oh, Brother Donnie, that belonged to somebody. Bless God, it did. The Bible says the wealth of the wicked stored up for the righteous. <laughs> Honey. Oh, you don't know where that money came from. That could have been a drug dealer. Let me lay my hands on you. See how quick I'll sanctify it. I'm telling you, God's in charge today. So if you stumbled in here discouraged, you stumbled down here not feeling good about yourself today, things are saying they're, they're in control, let them think it. Because sometimes ignorance not so bliss. God will show up and God will show out. Come on, let's bless the Lord in this house today. Real quickly, I want to show you three people. I thought this was very interesting. Three people that Jesus dealt with in this story that were ignorant to the fact. Number one was Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest. Caiaphas was a big deal. If you don't believe him, just ask him. He, 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 he was puffed up, and he's the guy in the story that gets all worked up with Jesus. Jesus. And they bring him before Caiaphas. This is such an interesting part of this story. And they bring him before Caiaphas in the middle of the night. Caiaphas looks at him, puffed up. And it's so interesting. You have the judge trying to preside over the king. And the judge says, I sentence you to death. And in that moment, Caiaphas had to feel pretty good. He'd been planning this for several chapters in our Bible, but several months for him. His plan had worked out. He had gotten him right where Jesus wanted him. Can I, can I tell you, there's going to be times that plans against you is going to work out for your enemy. I just want you to know, there's sometimes somebody tries to break up your marriage and for a moment they think it looks like they're going to win. Sometimes it looks like that someone's out to hurt you and stabbing you back, and it looks like for that moment that they might win. Sometimes they get to sit up and preside. But what I thought about this this morning is while this person's rejoicing in his plan coming to fruition, he had no idea that he was an acting part fulfilling in a plan that hadn't been going on for a couple of months but since the foundations of the earth. He's up here puffed up on Jesus saying, I got this, I did this, I made a plan. And Jesus responded to him saying, you don't you don't understand. I am the sacrifice since the foundation of the earth. And what you're doing, you think you're doing this on your own? But God is using you to put me in a position of my destiny. I just want to remind somebody in the house today, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That all things work together for good for even those that love the Lord. That even on your darkest day, when it seems like the enemy has won, God uses that to bless you and position you into the place of your destiny. Somebody might be fighting you right now, and it looks like they're winning, but God's using them to thicken your skin for what you're going to do later. God's using them to let you get on your knees and pray hard and pray through. When I think about some of the things I went through in my early ministry, I realized God was preparing me for leadership. My enemies were rejoicing. The devil thought he was winning, but God was using them to prepare me to be in a place where I could hold God's blessing. Somebody hear me in the house today? I, I thought that that's what I want you to understand. There are two plans. The enemy's plan may seem like it's work, but there's always a greater plan. Touch your neighbor and say, there's a greater plan. There's a greater plan, and it's being fulfilled. But see, here's what's the interesting part. What happened? I, I overlooked this. It's very powerful. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? For, somebody say, I'm ready. <laughs> Caiaphas sentences Jesus to death. Who sentenced him to death? But Caiaphas doesn't have the power to do so, does he? Why? How do we know this? Because he sends him to Pilate. Here's a part I overlooked. I, I hope you, that you get some of this like I get something out of this. He goes before Pilate, and when he sends him before Pilate, Pilate could have him sentenced to death. But there's a problem. His wife has been having bad dreams about Jesus. You remember? Who causes bad dreams? Hey, sometimes it's pizza. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Every pizza and you had some of the wildest dreams? But how many people know that God can trouble a spirit? You wake up and forget your nightmare, but a spiritual dream you'll remember forevermore. It's sometimes God can trouble your spirit. And Pilate will not profess judgment on Jesus. Read it. He won't do it. 
In fact, he washes his hands and says, I've got nothing to do with this. Amen. Got some distance on that one, son. Bless God. At least somebody's amen in me. Come on. Here, you might want to clean that up. I was about to pop it right back in. Now, what in the world was I talking about? You get to Pilate. Sends it back to Caiaphas. Caiaphas had to be on top of the world. It's done. Send it back to me. I, I, it's my word that stands. Pilate didn't say he's to die. Caiaphas sentenced him to death. Why is that important? Because in order for a sacrifice to be made on behalf of the people, the high priest had to be the one to do it. If Pilate would have done it, he'd have been a martyr. But because Caiaphas did it, he offered up the sacrifice as the high priest for the people. He didn't want to do it, but God used him to do it. He thought he was doing something only for him, but sometimes ignorance not so bliss because on behalf of you and behalf of me, the high priest of God's people said, kill him and let all of our sins be upon him. Oh, come on, I don't know if you got it or I'm not doing a good job. But that's how God operates. Caiaphas, what, do you think Caiaphas would have said, yes, I'd love to take part in Jesus' plan. I'd love to be, I would love to work with my enemy. I would love to help this person. He didn't, but that didn't stop the fact that God used him. That's what makes God great. Because I can use people that love me, but only God can use those that hate me. Oh, some of you ain't never been blessed by those that hate you, but I'm going to tell you, God's in the business. He can still do it. God used the high priest to offer up that. If Pilate would have said, let him die then, he wouldn't have been a sacrifice. But Pilate said, it's not up to me. Give him to Herod. Herod said, give it back to Pilate. Pilate finally said, you guys handle it. Caiaphas said, that's fine. Let him die. Honey, if he hadn't said, let him die, I wouldn't have healing in my body. If he hadn't said, let him die and offered him up, I wouldn't have victory in my body. If he hadn't said, let him die, I wouldn't be able to break the bonds of addiction that had been on my life. If he hadn't said, let him die, you know what, more importantly than when we let our loved ones die and we put them in the ground, we wouldn't be able to rejoice in the face of death. But because there was a high priest that even didn't know he was acting that said, offer him up as a sacrifice, we now have victory through the blood of Jesus Christ. But that was not the only interesting part that happened with Caiaphas. It, it really blew my mind when I saw this. How many people remember the story of Barabbas? You got Jesus, innocent, Barabbas, a felon. And Barabbas comes out, I'm like, what are y'all doing? Y'all bothering me? I was busy in here counting gnats in my cell. He knows there's no chance he's getting let loose. And he comes out and he hears the people begin to change their plea because the high priest and the Pharisees start saying, we want Barabbas, we want Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And people being the sheep that they are, come on somebody. You know why people believe what they believe today? It's because the TV tells them how to believe. Come on, don't get me preaching on something I'm not even supposed to be preaching on right now. Ever somebody come up and tell you that somebody's this and somebody's that and you say, well, why do you feel that way? I don't know, I heard it on TV. Sometimes people can be sheep. They start saying, we want Barabbas. And Barabbas is looking shocked. The high priest and the priest have let go Barabbas. And said, instead, we choose this one to which all of our sin unknowingly would fall. But did you know in the Old Testament in Leviticus, before there would be a sacrifice, there would have to be a scapegoat? And did you know before there would have to be a scapegoat, there'd have to be two goats. There would literally be two goats. One would be released, read your Bible, and the other would be sacrificed for the sin of people. I, I'm just telling you right now, 
that Caiaphas was sitting here and they had no idea when they were pumping this up and propping it up that they had just let the scapegoat go and they had set up the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know. I know at this point we might be confused, but I just want to tell you, isn't it good to know that no matter what we're facing and what we're going through, there's God that is absolutely in control. God used Caiaphas, and if you're thankful for that, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I gotta go. I, I might be trimming some things, but I, I, I got to get this in. But notice this. It was Caiaphas that sentenced Jesus to death, not Pilate. Point number two. The second person that, that uh, thought they were in charge were the soldiers. And this is interesting. The soldiers play a, a key part in this. But before I can show you their importance, do you not remember when Jesus was arrested? Jesus says to them, why, why are you coming in the middle of the night again? Have I not been in the temple teaching and preaching? Have I not been doing all these things and yet you're coming at me in the middle of the night? And what happens with the apostle Peter? Apostle Peter gets all worked up and takes his sword and tries to cut the head off of uh, somebody and ends up only cutting off their ear. And Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on and says, look, we don't need this. I'm going to go freely. Do you understand that? Jesus surrendered. Jesus was not captured. Do you believe that? You know how I know that? Because when they said, who's Jesus? And he said, I am he. The Bible says something happened spiritually that sent a sonic wave that knocked all the soldiers on their keisters. They had to pick themselves up and dust themselves off. Jesus was making it clear, you ain't arresting me. Get it right. I'm surrendering. Now, why is that interesting? Because notice this, and I never noticed this until I begin to study this. Notice that they take Jesus, the one who surrendered, who did not run away, who was going peacefully. And the Bible says they bound him with chains. They took and bound him. Now, I didn't think about how interesting that was until I really started thinking about it. Jesus didn't run. Jesus put somebody's ear back on. Jesus said, I'll go with you. So why would they put change on him? The moment they put change on him had to be a symbol of victory for them. They put change on his wrist. But what's interesting in this is, is I began to study, and when I was studying the scripture, I began to study the Levitical law and how they would offer up sacrifices for the people. And the Bible specifically says that the sacrifice must be bound. They didn't know why they were taking the chains out of their pockets and putting them on Jesus, but God did. I want to leave you with this, okay? Isn't it interesting to know that sometimes when people put chains on my life, we think the enemy's in charge, but it might just be God. There's only one way muscles grow, and that's with resistance and with friction. They cannot grow without it. We are the same way spiritually. Sometimes... We have to have change put on us. Oh, you don't think about that? Think about this. Think about the three Hebrew boys. When they were bound and thrown in a fiery furnace. Now, does that sound like a fun time to you? Because it don't me. I didn't see that on the vacation package. Do you have anything about being char-grilled in there? Because me and my family would love to be that. Anything? No? Think about that. They didn't ask for it. It had to be nerve-wracking. It was hot. They could feel the heat. In that moment, we celebrate their victory, but live with them in their moment. That They say this, if you throw me in that fire, my God's able to serve me, to save me. But notice what they say next. But even if he doesn't, they'll let you all let you know. They knew it was a possibility. But even if they don't, no, we ain't bending them. We're not bending a knee. The stress in that moment, but God allows them to be thrown in the fire. But when they come through the fire, Revival is brought to the kingdom. Sometimes when the enemy's chains are put on us, it's so that God can position us. Samson in his defeat was positioned for the greatest victory of them all, but sometimes we have to have the chains of the enemy. And the third and final one is Satan. Satan had victory. He had it all lined up. He was celebrating. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this, okay? He corrupts the religious leaders. He gets in the heart of Caiaphas. He works and makes sure that God's people are no longer ruling themselves, but a heathen 
uh, country with a heathen God is in control. And then finally, he corrupts one of the twelve to have Jesus handed over. That's a pretty good plan. That's a pretty good plan. They take and they take Jesus. And I can't imagine the feelings that the enemy must have had when they began to pound those nails into his hands and feet and Jesus screamed out in pain. I imagine there was a lot of Gideon and laughing. Could be wrong, but I'm sure he was very happy. And when they lifted up that cross and dropped it in the hole and the weight comes crashing down, getting into those nerves of those hands and legs, and Jesus cried out in pain. I can imagine that the enemy was pretty stoked about that. He had not counted on, and remember the words of Jesus, he said, when I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I just want you to know, there's going to be an enemy in your life that's celebrating. He celebrates when you get defeated. He celebrates every tear. But what he has not learned is that God uses these moments to form us into who we need to be and to give us victory. So I want you to stand with me, if you will. And while you're, I think we've got one more little... We got one more little blank, I think. The enemy will always try to stop Christ's will. But all he ends up doing is perpetuating his will. I'm here to tell you the enemy cannot stop you. The enemy cannot hinder you. He can only hinder you. He cannot stop you. What you're going through seems like defeat. It seems like you're never going to get over it. But God has positioned you for victory. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord.